story, which we're going to do in uh, just a minute here. We've got some in the first segment, some in the second segment. This is a giant, giant story. Later on, uh, if you were, uh, follow us on YouTube, you might have uh, seen my video raging about the Jake Tapper segment on CNN featuring Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, they aggressively challenged her, uh, claiming that her programs cost too much. No, really? On cable news? They attack the progressives, saying that they their ideas are, are not realistic and pragmatic? Well, I've never seen that before, except every single segment on our cable news on all three stations for decade after decade after decade. Yeah, when it has to do with the progressive, all of a sudden, CNN very curious about detailed policy proposals. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, you'd like to cut uh, taxes by trillions of dollars for the rich. Yeah. You'd like to start wars and claim, as the Bush administration did, that it... The Iraq war would cost $1.7 billion, not trillion, billion dollars. Okay. Anyway, so uh, there was, what he did was terribly misleading at best. And I think there was, in reality, a big lie in that segment. And so I want to expose what that is. That's going to be a little bit later in the program after we get through the Kavanaugh stories. And I don't want you to miss that. Uh, well, there's a ton of uh, news today. So let's get going. All right. Over the weekend, the anonymous woman who had made sexual assault allegations against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh decided to reveal her identity and give specific details about what she says happened uh, back in the 1980s when he allegedly sexually assaulted her. Her name is Christine Blasey Ford, and she is a psychology professor in Northern California. And she spoke with Emma Brown of the Washington Post and, and did give some specific details that I want to share with you. Mm -hmm. She claims that at the time, even though she doesn't remember the exact date, Kavanaugh was 17 years old, and she believes she was 15 years old. Now, on uh, the summer or I'm sorry, one summer, uh, in the early 1980s, Kavanaugh and a friend both stumbling drunk corralled Ford into a bedroom during a gathering of teenagers at a house in Montgomery County. Uh, she was quoted as saying uh, that while his friend watched, Kavanaugh pinned her to a bed on her back and groped her over her clothes, grinding his body against hers and clumsily attempting to pull off her one-piece bathing suit and the clothing she wore over it, when she tried to scream, he put his hand over her mouth. So at that point, she says that she feared for her life. In fact, she, she, she was quoted as saying, I thought he might inadvertently kill me. And it wasn't until the other person in the room, Kavanaugh's friend, Mark Judge, it wasn't until he got involved that she was able to escape. Kavanaugh's friend and classmate at Georgetown Prep School, Mark Judge, jumped on top of them, sending all three tumbling, Ford ran from the room, briefly locked herself in a bathroom, and then fled the house. So there are important pieces of, in my opinion, evidence that uh, really help reinforce her story, and we'll get to that in just a minute, but Cenk, I'd like you to jump in. So one thing I want to be clear about in terms of the friend Judge and his role in it, um, he earlier had put out a statement saying, I have no recollection of that, which I found to be um, inconclusive to say the least. Uh, usually saying I have no recollection of that means, well, do you have the evidence yet or don't you? Uh, but now he's much clearer on the record. He says, it's just absolutely nuts. I never saw Brett act that way. He described Kavanaugh as a brilliant student and not, quote, not into anything crazy or illegal. Uh, now there's uh, lots of talk by Judge, who later went into rehab, uh, in fact, wrote a book about his travails uh, with drinking. Uh, lots of talk in his book about that, and there's even a guy who appears to be Kavanaugh in the book. They uh, used a very slight pseudonym for him. It was literally, his last name was literally O. Kavanaugh. Yeah, that's uh, the smallest pseudonym you could do. Um, anyway, uh, apparently they were both drinking heavily uh, that summer, you do with that what you will, and, and I want everybody to be super clear. Nobody's judging Kavanaugh for drinking too much when he was in high school. That's not remotely the issue. The issue is what, what he did that day, okay? 
And so, uh, on the other hand, uh, as even Maggie Kelly pointed out, um, if she's making up the story, why would she put a friend of his in the room, which would only corroborate his story if they remain friends? So it's not the type of thing that you would do if you, I don't think, if you were making up a story. And now, look, if we're going to get into it, you have, like, there's a lot of Republican chatter about how this is an 11th hour move by the Democrats, like at the last minute. Okay, but to me that's irrelevant. The only question is, is it true or is it not true? So, should they have released it earlier? Well, Diane Feinstein was apparently trying to uh, keep her identity secret because she didn't want it coming out. Now it's too late for that. Uh, and so, maybe it would have never come out if it wasn't for some of the other Democratic senators, etc. But that's, that explains the 11th hour thing. It doesn't go toward, towards whether it's true or not. So that's what we have to try to judge here. And you might come to a conclusion that's inconclusive. Mm -hmm. Right? You might say, hey, it's 35 years ago. They both have spotty memories. One side was heavily drinking, etc., etc. But I think that's the question. And in the very beginning, when this story first broke, we asked the question of, whoa, if it's back in high school, it's got to be a pretty high bar to have this affect a nomination. Well, attempted rape is, has met that bar. Exactly. So there are things that we've learned about uh, Ford's past that I think are very relevant in, in reinforcing her story. So one of the main things that an accuser gets asked is whether or not he or she spoke to someone in their personal life about the attempted sexual misconduct or alleged sexual misconduct. And she hadn't spoken to anyone in her personal life. However, she and her husband did go to couples therapy in 2012 where she opened up to a, uh, a therapist about this. So let me give you the details on that. Ford said she told no one of the incident in any detail until 2012. Again, 2012, that's an important year, remember that, when she was in couples therapy with her husband. The therapist notes, do not mention Kavanaugh's name, but say she was attacked by students from an elitist boy school who went on to become highly respected and high-ranking members of society in Washington. So she did, it's on the record, it's in the therapist's notes, which were shared with the Washington Post. But there's more. Um, notes from an individual therapy session the following year show Ford described a rape attempt in her late teens. Then there's the third piece of, in my opinion, evidence in this case. So one of the things that she did, Ford did, uh, when this was all happening back in July, we had no idea about it, was she approached Washington lawyer Deborah Katz. She told her about these allegations. And so Katz responded with, everyone's going to think you're lying. And so to deal with that inevitable outcome ahead of time, Ford agreed to do a polygraph test. And so she took a lie detector test and she passed. And so that is an important piece of evidence as well. However, uh, Brett Kavanaugh is aggressively denying these allegations. When the allegations first came up with no details included, he said, I categorically and unequivocally deny this allegation. I did not do this back in high school or at any time. And uh, he was even asked about this by Senator Hirono from uh, Hawaii. And uh, here's what he had to say. Since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? No. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement related to this kind of conduct? No. So he has been denying all these allegations. There were other statements of denial that came out after this, uh, but... We'll see how this plays out. Right now, you have uh, Democrats and even some Republicans calling for a postponement of the uh, Senate Judiciary vote on Kavanaugh. They were set to vote on his confirmation uh, this week on September 20th, but that is now in jeopardy considering the detailed allegations that came out over the weekend. So Ford had married her husband in 2002, and early in their relationship, she told him she'd been a victim of physical abuse. Uh, and that was 10 years before they went to couples therapy, uh, and uh, the therapist noted it in their records. Now, there is something in there that cuts in, in two directions. Uh, one is the obvious one. Uh, she's not, she didn't go to the therapist uh, the other day after Kavanaugh was appointed to be a Supreme Court justice, and they're going through the confirmation hearings, and she s says all of a sudden, hey, I remember Kavanaugh. 
right? No, this is back in 2012 and 2013 that it's in the therapist notes. Now, the thing that cuts in the other direction is at the time, she he was already a high-ranking judge, and she was aware, according to the people, including her ex-husband, uh, that uh, that he could be nominated for a higher position. Okay, so then think about that for a second, though. In order for you to, uh, there's two possibilities if you're in the camp of Kavanaugh didn't do it. First of all, you should check yourself as to why you're in that camp. Are you in that camp because you're positive about the details of the story, or you like his policy positions and hence think, well, I'm going to tilt things in his direction, okay? Because I ask myself that all the time. I've been asking it for the last three days as we've been covering this story about, wait, who do I believe and why do I believe that, right? So you would have to think that either she was telling the truth, she just had the wrong guy, and it's 35 years ago, and it was O. Kavanaugh or O. Connor, or, I don't know, right? But that's, look, it's 35 years ago, it was in high school, it is some possibility. You could be in that camp, right? You could be in the camp that that she's, it's not a thing you could fudge, right? It's not a thing that's a miscommunication. So now, I don't want people to misunderstand this as I talk about it. So if it was a date rape situation, it would be just as bad. The, the, the but in that is there would be more room for miscommunication 35 years later. I thought he meant this and I thought she meant that. That is not the situation here. She describes they, they don't know each other except that they're at this party uh, and Kavanaugh and Judge are uh, drinking upstairs and at some point, and she is vague on the details and you because it was a long time ago, and just consider all the factors here, right? She doesn't remember how she got home, etc. But she says she clearly remembers they pulled her into a room. It was basically an abduction within the party. So it leaves less room for, I thought she meant this and I thought he meant that. So this is, this is a stark uh, case here. So then you have to think, she made it up. Because it's not a miscommunication. Mm -hmm. It's not a he said, she said in terms of how did that particular night go? How did that particular day go? How did that date go? Okay. So this is, no, they pulled me in the room, he pinned me down, and then covered my mouth uh, when I started screaming. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now back to the therapist, 2012, 2013. Do you think she's a respected uh, professor in her field uh, in psychology? Uh, and she is at Palo Alto uh, College, I believe. Uh, they do work with Stanford, etc. Well respected, right? She's 51 years old. Do you think... So I guess six years ago, she would have been 45. A 45-year-old is going to go into a couples therapy session about her marriage, and in that kind of setting, is going to set up a lie just in case this Kavanaugh guy winds up being confirmed. Because she doesn't come forward then. She's not worried about his federal uh, judge positions at that point. It's going to set up a lie that might come into play six years, 12 years later, in the middle of her couples therapy Try to save her marriage. I mean, and if she were to do that, wouldn't she just name him rather than, you know, using a description? And, and by the way, the, the polygraph test is important. The lie detector test is important. Um, and she is uh, willing, based on what her lawyer says, to testify uh, you know, before senators to answer any questions that they may have. Uh, Brett Kavanaugh responded by saying that he would also testify. These are all important details. And look, I don't know what the truth is. We don't know uh, without a shadow of a doubt what the truth is. We're not investigating this case. We just know the details that have been reported, that have been made public. But what I'm calling for and what I think is a reasonable request is to postpone this vote so a real investigation can take place. Because, look, anyone else who's applying for any job, any average American applying for any average job, would have to deal with some sort of an investigation if these types of allegations were lodged against them. Or they wouldn't even have a chance at getting that job. But this is a possible Supreme Court justice. He should be held to a higher standard because he is going to make decisions that impact our lives. And so I think it makes all the sense in the world to not rush through a vote so Republicans can have their political win. Let's take politics out of it for a second and actually look into these allegations to see uh, if there's any truth behind them. And she has, throughout all the therapist notes, et cetera, and the discussions she had in the past, referred it to, to it as a rape attempt. So it's not an, a scandalous thing she made up today to make it sound worse. No, that's how she's always described it. She said 
that had traumatized her for years on end, her relationship, and that's why it came up in the therapy session. So her relationship with other men, etc. She also went on to say that uh, if Judge hadn't uh, jumped on top of there, we don't know what his motivations were, and they're both apparently, as she describes it, incredibly drunk. Um, but if he hadn't done that, she hadn't then gotten loose, that she was worried he might have inadvertently killed her. Mm-hmm. And that's how serious it was. And by the way, how did she get away? This part, it, at least in her account, is clear. She ran, as soon as they fell off the bed, she immediately ran into a bathroom and locked it. It would not come out until she heard them stumbling down the, the stairs. stairs. Then she unlocked the door and ran out of the house. Okay, so it is, the description of the event is very stark. So you have to believe that she made all that up six years ago to try to frame Kavanaugh today. That's a hell of a thing to do. So, and look, let me just touch on the politics real quick. It's, if you think she made it up, then you think it's because of politics. And now, of course, the, the, the smears have already begun. And, like, legitimate things to talk about. Is she a Democrat? Is she a Republican? For example, Roy Moore's accusers were Republicans. So, in a sense, they had more credibility because they had no political dog in the fight to begin with, right? I get it. And, and, and the professor here has given small amounts to Democrats before. It's not some big donor or anything like that. But, okay, you can take that in, in, into account. So, if you think she's lying, you think it's because of politics. And I get that this would delay it. And that if it's delayed and, or if Kavanaugh has to withdraw, they will not be able to get a new nominee before the elections. And as things stand today, and this is not what the Democrats expected, but as it turns out, there's a poll out today saying Democrats are leading in Arizona and Tennessee in Senate races that were expected to go to Republicans, which would flip the Senate, which could affect Kavanaugh or the next judge's appointment. Obviously, remember what happened with Merrick Garland and how the Republicans blocked it for uh, an enormous period of time. So there are those political forces at play. So if I thought it's something that's made up, I'd say, look, you got to keep it real. That's a that's a consideration here. Would the Republicans do something like that? Well, I would be skeptical, right? I'd, I'd look into it pretty closely, given how much this might affect the overall seat, the Supreme Court seat. Yeah. Uh, but given her story, it would be extraordinary, extraordinary if she was making it up. I, I mean, that would be foresight and political calculation in a field that she is not in at all. In the midst of the toughest times in her life, that would be borderline shocking. And she's already passed the polygraph test. But it looks like they're both going to go and testify. So we'll have more information. So should they delay these proceedings? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm telling you that not because, ha ha, we, I want to delay it because of political reasons. I just explained it to you so you, you can make up your own mind as to what you think the political calculations are. So irrespective of that, you can't, or because of that, hey, I, the Democrats might be able to delay if they win the Senate, etc. I'm just going to push this guy through even though he might have done an attempt to rape at some point. It's not a sentence you want to speak. I mean, that... that and to be fair to the Republicans, a number of them, not all of them, not most of them, but a couple of them have now come out and said, no, we got to hear them out. And we especially have to hear her out. So that's good. And of course, Democrats agree. There's one final part of this that I want to touch on, and it has to do with what you had referenced earlier, Jenk, about uh, the book that Mark Judge had written. So Mark Judge had to go to rehab for alcoholism, and he had written about that in his book and, you know, wrote extensively about his experience drinking when he was much younger and uh deborah katz who is the lawyer for ford uh touched on the fact that judge had denied these accusations but also talked about how certain things are now missing they've been scrubbed from the record either on social media or otherwise uh pertaining to mark and what he had said mark judge and what he had said about his his lifestyle and Kavanaugh's lifestyle earlier. So I, I want to give you that video so you can see what uh, you know she has to say about it. Take a look. The other person who was in the room, a man by the name of Mark Judge, according to your uh, your client, said this didn't happen. He said it's just not this didn't happen. Your response? Well, he's also written uh, three books and many many articles and uh, 
Twitter posts that have all now been completely uh, scrubbed from the public domain, where he acknowledges that that was behavior that, uh, uh, from his Georgetown prep school days, that they were keenly engaged in tremendous drinking and really uh, inappropriate behavior, and that uh, the drinking was so severe that they were blacked out uh, regularly. That's now been scrubbed. I think that's relevant. I mean, yeah. why are you scrubbing those things if you have nothing to hide? So we'll see if people can find that. You can't really erase anything on the Internet. So uh, we'll see if they find those. And w it might be just personally embarrassing things to him that he didn't expect that the whole world's going to be looking at him. Uh, we don't know if it's necessarily related to Kavanaugh, but obviously erasing things at the 11th hour is is relevant. Uh, and, and another thing that's relevant here, uh, by the way, if you care about um, – Ford's politics, then you should care about Mike Judge's politics, because um, you know if you think, hey, well, if she's a Democrat, that might influence her to lie. Well, Mike Judge is a Republican and has written for the Daily Caller, the Weekly Standard, and obviously is friends with Kavanaugh. So keep that in mind as well. So last thing from my perspective uh, on this is, um, remember, Ford did not want to come forward, and she went on to say through her attorneys that she was actually thankful to Feinstein. That was a conversation we had on Friday. Did Feinstein cover this up because she thought it wasn't, not a big deal, but that, hey, it's not right to bring up accusations from high school or it won't play well politically? We were having that conversation. Well, it appears that question has been settled to some degree because Ford and her lawyer are saying, no, 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 Feinstein was trying to do right by us. We didn't want to come out because we knew we would be viciously attacked, right or wrong, and that those smears have begun. So I told you the tip of the iceberg of things that aren't 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 even smears. They're just about her voting record, etc. But questioning her credibility, etc., has also begun begun today. And apparently, uh, Ford explained to the Washington Post, "These are all the hills I was trying to avoid." Now, now that she's been exposed, because BuzzFeed reporters had gone in and other reporters had started calling all of her friends, she knew that they were going to. They already knew who she was, and it was going to get revealed. She says, now I feel like my civic responsibility is outweighing my anguish and terror about retaliation. So keep that in mind, too. So if this was a plant from back in 2012, why did she feel this anxiety about the anguish and terror of, of having to come forward? So much so that she didn't come forward. She went to her congresswoman. She went to Feinstein. She remained anonymous with the press. But she didn't want to name herself and go through all this stuff because she knows what the right-wing attack machine looks like. Mm -hmm. And she's been forced into the spotlight now because of reporters uncovering who she is. Well, that's also relevant. If it was a trap, why wouldn't you come out immediately and say, yeah, got you, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of evidence for the moment being in the public record that seems to indicate uh, that uh, – She's telling the truth. Uh, it's certainly, she certainly, in my estimation, thinks she's telling the truth. Uh, and there's good evidence to back her up. I guess the last thing that those guys would hang their hat on is maybe she had the wrong guy. But she seems pretty clear on who it was. Yeah. By the way, Mike Judge also does not deny that Kavanaugh was there. He just says none of this ever happened. Right. Exactly. All right, uh, we're going to take a break, but when we come back, uh, we're going to give you some of the smear campaigning that's coming from Republicans. We're also going to give some credit to Republican senators who are saying, let's let's pump the brakes and, and postpone this vote before uh, we make a mistake. So come right back. I'll tell you who those people are. I just shot a clip. It's time sensitive and it needs to be edited. Yeah. Did anybody call for it?
carefully is Simon Biesenthal. Yeah, see, Simon Biesenthal. Yeah, that's good to that. She posted it in the yard of Simon Biesenthal.
Uh, Steve, now I'm going to go to the members' comments. Stephen Mankey says, really the scary thing is to think of how common the Kavanaugh situation is, given how reluctant most girls are to come forward to, for understandable reasons. Think about all the people who have not come forward. It's a good, good point by Stephen. Um, Michelle with an excellent point in the member section. She said, I am furious with the Kavanaugh situation. I'm so disgusted with the gender bias inherent in the story. Boys being intoxicated equals being less responsible for their actions. A girl being intoxicated, she becomes responsible for not only her actions, but the actions of someone violating her. That's right. That's, That's a great point, That Michelle. always happens. Always. Yes. Thank you for the writing it, that in. And now uh, I'm going to tell you about membership, so let me just start by giving you one quote here. Alan uh, today writes in from the members uh, section, I just became a member after listening for uh, for free for a couple of years, and I absolutely love all of the content. I can't believe how much you get for only five bucks a month. It's more than worth it. Thanks for everything you guys do. Thank you, Alan. We appreciate it. Thank you for signing up, too. Um, and we do think it's a, a bit like Progressive Netflix. You've got more than a dozen shows that you can watch and listen to. Uh, so one of the questions you guys have been asking about is, hey, what happened to the investment money? So I, I want to just address that real quick here for a second. Uh, first, uh, since we're doing the membership drive, uh, let's take a look at where we are. Remember, we started uh, right after Labor Day at 27661 uh, It's at tyt.com slash join to become a member. Let's see where we are today. 31405 uh, so that is great, great uh, beginning to this drive. Uh, we got to keep that going. And we're calling it be on the left side of history and help us build a home of progressives. So uh, that naturally leads to questions that are understandable. Hey, guys, you got investment money back in 2017. It was $20 million. So, uh, you know, what did you guys do with it? Okay, now, let's just acknowledge no other company would ever tell you. <laughs> Okay, that's a state secret. No, it's, uh, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Can I tell you all the details? Of course not. I can't tell you people's salaries, their privacy concerns, et cetera, et cetera. But I will share with you guys more than almost anyone else will. Uh, and, and the first part of it is that you have to understand, and we get really into inside baseball here, but because we really, your trust is super important to us. And I think we've earned it over the last 16 years. But it's partly by being honest like this and telling you how things work, right, when you ask. So uh, investment does not equal revenue. In order to be a sustainable business, your revenues have to equal your costs and hopefully be a little above them, okay? So when you take investment money in, that doesn't mean that you have become sustainable or that you can go to the Bahamas. That's not how it works. The way it, it works is you take the money in and you put it into infrastructure, into building a company that can then become sustainable and hopefully profitable, okay? So what does that mean? Well, there's mundane things like HR and finance, and you guys might think, oh, I ain't got nothing to do with finance. <laughs> okay, yeah, that doesn't help me. That's not an extra show. You're right, but a company needs that. There's, there's no way around that. And so that is a little bit of what the money went into. The other things are things that we've been dying to give you guys for all these years. Look at all the new wonderful apps that we have on Androids and iOS, etc. The new websites launched. That takes engineers. I know that Donald Trump thinks engineers are weak, but we have to think they're strong. And we've got a good team of engineers now and product guys, etc. So that we can give you all the products so that you can easily watch and consume the shows that we've been giving you. Uh, the other part of it, of course, uh, is the shows themselves. So there's a whole bunch of new shows, uh, partly because we're now up on skinny bundles like YouTube TV and there are more to come, uh, partly because we want to give you guys those shows as podcasts, etc. So Anna's got a new show, No Filter, John's got, John Iderola has a new show, Damage Report, Reasonably Sure by Michael Shore. Uh, you know Aggressive Progressive has been around a while, but also to maintain that and bring on the Jimmy Dore Show as a podcast, etc. All that requires producers, editors, graphics people, stage crew, let alone the hosts. So obviously those are all expenses. That's what you build. You build what we call the home of progressives, and I think it's fair to characterize it as I just did a little while ago as a progressive Netflix. Then you have to make revenue to try to make sure that you cover your costs. So there's still a ton of people that work here uh, and, and the rent, etc. For some of you, this is obvious. It's super obvious. But for others, I want to make sure that...
don't understand how it works. So why are we doing the membership drive? Because that's revenue. That actually makes... Lake of Arizona, and then Bob Corker of Tennessee, uh, both Republicans who are retiring at the end of their terms, uh, join Democrats in urging a delay in the vote until the committee hears from Ford. The panel is, was scheduled to vote on Thursday afternoon on Kavanaugh's nomination, and as I mentioned, it doesn't appear that that will happen uh, now that there will be a hearing next Monday. Uh, Jeff, oh, go ahead. Yeah, a couple of things here, guys. Uh, one is... Um a flake is on the Judiciary Committee. So without him, they could not have gone forward anyway. If he voted to, uh, to not confirm or to not wrap up the proceedings, the Republicans had no choice. And he clearly indicated that he would not go forward. So now that <coughs> Flake came out, let alone Corporate, if they lose Flake and Corporate on the overall vote, let alone Murkowski and Collins, they're toast. He won't even get confirmed. So now that uh, they realize they can't just push this through as they were originally planning, then that's why the hearings begin on Monday. Because they're like, okay, well then we got to hurry. Because if it lasts any longer, we might not make it before the midterm elections. So now that uh, the couple of Republicans have forced their hand, the rest of the Republicans are going, okay, then let's go, let's go, let's get them in right now, right now. Get Kavanaugh on, get her in, and let's try to wrap this thing up. That's what you're seeing today. Exactly. So uh, to give you Flake's statement, he said, I've made it clear that I'm not comfortable moving ahead with the vote on Thursday if we have not heard her side of the story or explored this further. He continues to say, for me, we can't vote until we hear more. And as Jake pointed, uh, he is a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, so it is important to have him on board. Also, uh, you know, keep in mind that uh, Flake, that just to be fair and full disclosure, he has been a vocal opponent and critic of Donald Trump. So that might be relevant to you. I want to make sure you know about that. Also, uh, Bob Corker said the following, a delay would be best for all involved, including the nominee. If she does want to be heard, she should do so promptly. And if she does participate in this hearing next Monday, then it would be pretty prompt. <laughs> so we'll see.
Again, we don't know for sure whether or not she's agreed to testifying on Monday. So Senator Collins is theoretically pro-choice, so she has to pretend that somehow Kavanaugh is not going to vote uh, with the pro-life position, which he probably will. Uh, and he has been, uh, he's voted uh, against uh, abortion rights in the past as a judge. So, uh, but even for those who are pro-life, Corker, uh, Flake, etc. Well, they've got to, it would have been interesting to see what they would have done if they didn't hate Trump. Okay, and if Trump had not attacked them over and over again. Because all the other Republicans stood firm. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's get Kavanaugh in. Because we really need a pro, in their view, a pro-life justice, right? So we got to, and they keep giving Trump credit because he got Gorsuch confirmed. They say that's one of the best moments of his presidency. I happen to think it's not that hard uh, to get somebody confirmed. All you got to do is pick a Republican when the Republicans are in charge and just make sure that they didn't commit attempted rape earlier. Oops, Trump couldn't even meet that bar. Anyway, we'll, we'll see how it winds up. But, um, but now, given how much Trump has antagonized Flake and Corker, when you get to what they consider to be a close call, because they do really want a pro-life justice on the Supreme Court, they go, uh, no, let's hear her out. Yeah. So that's Trump screwing himself by being, as usual, over the top antagonistic to people he might need later. It's because he has no sense of politics or decorum or basically getting anything done. Right. But also consider that even if Flake and Corker are vocal opponents or critics of Donald Trump, they have voted along with his policy proposals and, and basically do what he wants. But in this case, they're speaking out, and I, I, I still commend them for it, regardless of what their intentions are. I think that they're still doing the right thing. By the way, uh, Senators Murkowski and Collins also uh, released a statement about this. Uh, Murkowski saying, I think that might be something they might have to consider, meaning postponing the vote, at least having that discussion. This is not something that came up during the hearings. The hearings are now over, and if there is real substance to this, it demands a response that may be something the committee needs to look into. And Collins also said, I want to have both individuals come before the Senate Judiciary Committee to testify under oath. Both individuals have agreed to do that. It, it just remains to be seen whether or not they're planning on doing it this coming Monday. So those comments were before uh, the news broke just a little while ago that the hearings are going to pick back up next Monday. But it's because of those comments that that happened. Okay. Exactly. And then one more from Warren Hatch, who is firmly on Kavanaugh's side and says he believes him. But he says, if that were true, Ford's allegations, I think it would be hard for senators not to consider who he is today. So um, even Hatch saying, well, if it's true, that's not good news. Right. And, and Hatch so far has been defending Kavanaugh pretty aggressively. Yes, so. very much so. Yeah. Um, one other part of the story that is, in my opinion, important. Last Friday, uh, there was a letter released that was signed by about 65 women who know Kavanaugh, who have known him throughout the years, and who uh, supported Kavanaugh and his character. Uh, they were vouching for him. Well, today, there are individuals who have known the accuser, uh, Christine Ford. And they are sticking by her side, and they have some allegations of their own that I think are interesting, not in regard to Kavanaugh, but I do want you to hear their statements. Now, this letter that was signed by uh, women who have gone to school with Ford uh, say the following, We believe Dr. Uh, Blasey Ford and are grateful that she came forward to tell her story. It demands a thorough and independent investigation before the Senate can reasonably vote on Brett Kavanaugh's nomination to a lifetime seat on the nation's highest court. This is the part that stood out to me. They also write, many of us are survivors ourselves. The letter had received three dozen additional signatures as of Monday morning. Just to be absolutely clear, they're not referring to Kavanaugh in specific in being survivors. So uh, this is uh, partly to counter the Republicans' letter that came out a day after the allegations where they had 65 women. And by the way, I should correct the record on this. Uh, when we were discussing it, I said, I thought those were women that knew Kavanaugh all throughout his career? No, those are 65 women that knew him back in high school till now, spanning that 35 years. So they did all know him from high school. They apparently got, the Republicans claim they got that, those signatures within 24 hours. That seems 
totally unbelievable. So, and I think Anna made a terrific point about that on Friday. So, how did the Republicans get this letter all ready to go to defend Kavanaugh if they didn't know about the charges? That Now, a lot of people made that point, but Anna added on top. Remember when Mitch McConnell warned Trump, don't pick Kavanaugh, don't pick him, and he said it was because there was too much of a document trail. Too many documents? That's what Mitch McConnell was worried about? Yeah. Perhaps there were some Republican senators who already knew about this, had the letter prepared, and that's why they were telling Trump, don't do it. Could Trump, by the way, having heard the allegations, think, what's the big deal? I've been accused of, the, of similar things, and move forward anyway. Now, that's, we don't know yet, but it is curious that McConnell gave that warning, and it is curious that they had their letter ready to go immediately. Absolutely, and, and also keep in mind that the paper trail or the documentation regarding Kavanaugh's decisions and rulings in the past, it was just par for the course when it comes to a conservative judge. There was nothing that really stood out during the confirmation hearings that would convince Republican senators to vote against Kavanaugh. So I remember during those confirmation hearings, I'm like, oh, something really bad's going to come out. And nothing came out from those documents. I mean, nothing that would upset Republican senators. Of course, stuff came out that would upset progressives or, or, or left-leaning uh, lawmakers. But overall, it was to be expected. The stuff that came out was to be expected. So I don't know. Look, this is obviously my speculation, but I feel like McConnell was worried about these allegations that did come out. No, it's a really good point. It, it could be that McConnell was worried that it would take too long, and now it is taking too long, but not because of the documents. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is also possible that McConnell thought, look, I got 51 votes, and they're locked in. I don't have to worry about anything unless it's something so bad that the Republicans would have to vote against them. And and so him, his warnings to Trump are at a bare minimum relevant.
things that both, you know, help them or hurt them. Like, Donald Trump Jr. is like, oh, yeah, I just held on to it till the 11th hour. I mean, she didn't just hold on to it. She, Dianne Feinstein isn't the person who revealed her identity. This happened the way that Jake described. The media got hold of, of the details, the information, the identity of the accuser. They were contacting her incessantly. And she saw that the narrative was being controlled by people who had no idea what happened. So she decided to come forward and reveal who she was. By the way, I have no love for Senator Feinstein. I think that she's a complete and utter disaster. And I wish that she would have been voted out of office uh, during the primaries. But with that said, I think the way she handled this yeah, she was in a tough spot because you have a woman coming forward with these allegations. She demands to remain anonymous and you have to honor that. You have to respect that, especially given how incredibly rough it is for a woman to come forward with sexual assault allegations against a person in a position of power. As we're seeing here. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, uh, by the way, Donald Trump himself, he is doubling down on his support for Brett Kavanaugh. He says that Kavanaugh is one of the finest people he's ever met. Um, and he also, In this case, that might be true. It might be true. But that's right. a very low bar. Yeah, especially for someone who has been accused of sexual assault himself by several different women. That's Donald Trump. Donald Trump, yes. Uh, Trump has no intention of dropping Kavanaugh's nomination and that uh, the White House plans to try to defend against the charges that were made. And it's already playing out. We're already seeing it. The final part of this is Orrin Hatch. So Senator Orrin Hatch uh, believes Kavanaugh, uh, does not believe the accuser, and he's been very clear about it. Take a look. So I talked to him on the phone today. And what did he say to you? Well, he didn't do that. And he wasn't at the party. So, you know, there's clearly somebody's mixed up. He said he wasn't at the party that you guys were fine to. Yeah. Um, he's a, a very strong, decent man. And you believe him? Yeah, I sure do. Do uh, you believe the accusers? Yeah. Well, I, I think she's mistaken. I think she's, she's mistaken something. See, I, I don't know how Orrin Hatch knows. So the, when the story uh, came out, uh, we had a tough conversation about how do you know, right? Mm -hmm. And I, we talked immediately about what if the shoe was on the other foot. Now, uh, things seem to be a little bit clearer based on all of the evidence that has come out about how she told a therapist, the therapist took it in her notes back in 2012, and that it had forced, you know, it, 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 she talked about it in the couples therapy because it was so traumatic for her and it was creating issues for her with other men, etc. So now there's a lot more evidence that seems to indicate that she talked about this earlier, etc., right? Okay, so that leads me to believe her. For the moment being, we'll see, we'll hear their testimony. I mean, anything is possible, right? But Hatch either have you seen that evidence or no evidence at all goes, no, no, he's positive, Kavanaugh's right, she's wrong. Other than your politics, how could you be positive of that? That well, doesn't make any sense. Well, Orrin Hatch uh, has a pattern, has displayed a pattern uh, of doing this, especially when there are similar allegations or allegations of sexual misconduct against Republicans. So um, I'm gonna, we're going to take a little time machine back to earlier this year where Orrin Hatch decided to believe uh, Rob Porter over his ex-wives in uh, domestic assault or domestic abuse allegations. So again, this is Orrin Hatch from earlier this year. Take a look. What was your conversation like with the pastor? Well, you know, I'm somebody who conflicts and helping people. And uh, it, was a, it was a conversation to let him know that if he needs help in the future, I'll try to be there. Thanks, sir. He's a good guy. No question. That I don't understand. I really don't understand what's happening. Do you believe these allegations against the people and the women? I don't believe them all, but I, I, I think there's enough there that you, you have to take it very seriously. So, why, okay, why don't you believe them all? Uh, and if you're taking it seriously, it's constantly with Hatch and unfortunately with a lot of the older Republican senators, let alone older the men throughout society uh, is gun instinct. Is I believe the guy, and I want to help the guy. Like the victims, uh, yeah, right? But the guy, the guy needs help. Kavanaugh, of course, I believe Kavanaugh. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. Yeah. Porter, I, I want to go see how I can, he was charged. The accusations were that he beat women, and he's like, oh, I got to go see how I can help. Him. There was a photo of one of his ex-wives with, uh, you know, bruises on her face. Yeah. That went viral. And look, I get it. They work with these people. And so they form bonds and friendships. And they, I'm, 
if I'm being super fair to, to Orrin Hatch, he didn't see that side of Porter, so he wanted to help the guy that, that was helpful to him in his uh, dealings with him, etc. But at a fair, fair minimum, you have to be more mindful of the potential victims. And so often, we see callous responses that is not mindful of that at all. Exactly. And if we go even further back uh, to the early 1990s, when Justice Clarence Thomas was dealing with allegations or, or trying to defend himself against allegations uh, by Anita Hill, Hatch did the same thing and uh, simultaneously bashed Anita Hill. Take a look. Judge, there are a lot of things that just don't make sense to me in Anita Hill's testimony. I liked her personally. I thought she presented herself well. And I think everybody who listened to her wants to like her, and, 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 uh, and uh, many do. But Judge, it bothers me because it just doesn't square with what I think is, is uh, some of it doesn't square with what I think is uh, common experience. And just basic sense, common sense. And I know it's, it outrages you, as it would me, as it would anybody who is accused of these type of activities. Yeah, I mean, Orrin Hatch has never experienced anyone put pubic hair on his can of Coke, so it doesn't square with him. That's, that's just what he thinks. I, I mean, t t that's so frustrating because, so the pubic hair and the, and the Coke is the most commonly used example, but I think it's among the worst examples of what Clarence Thomas did with Anita Hill. He kept badgering her uh, for sexual favors and to go out uh, with her. That's a million times worse than a joke about pubic hair and the coke, etc. So, the, the, so, Orrin Hatch, have you had emails constantly haranguing you for, to, for sex at work? I'm going to tender a guess that the answer is no. Okay, so it reminds me of when white people say, oh, cops don't beat me up for no reason, so they, I guess they're not doing it to black people. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means you didn't experience it. So, and the fact that you have no empathy can't, for all these decades, Orrin Hatch, you've had a chance to develop empathy and still haven't done it yet. So, now other lines of attack they're going to use and they're, what they're calling their counteroffensive is going to be, hey, they uh, made these accusations late. That does not affect the credibility of the accusations even 1%. Right. So I think that's a really weak argument. They're going to say that the accuser never told anybody about the incident at the time when they were in high school. She did tell therapists in 2012 and 2013, and it's documented in their notes. But they say, no, she should have told somebody at the time. What else should she have done as a young girl who was 15 years old and, and had nearly been raped? She said on her way home, she was so worried that somebody was going to notice that she was abused and ask her about it. She was so afraid of what people might think and why was she at the party where there was underage drinking, etc. Yeah. Now we're going to go back in a time machine and blame her for everything she did on that day when she was the one attacked. It's also, so that's the attacks that are coming. Let me add to that. It, it's very common, extremely common for victims of sexual assault or rape, both men and women, to feel like it was their fault, even if they were the victims. And so they feel shame about it, and as a result, will not report it, will not tell anyone about it. So that's something to keep in mind. I mean, she was 15 at the time. And so coming forward and, and, and talking about that publicly at that age is not an easy thing to do, and I wouldn't you know, put it against her for, for refusing to do that at the time. And Maggie Kelly uh, presented two sides of this uh, on NBC. And to be fair to her, she made a very good point on the side of the accuser, saying, why would the accuser put uh, another friend of Kavanaugh in the room if she was making it up? She knows that that guy will very likely testify with Kavanaugh whether it's true or not true. So that adds credibility to the accuser. That's a great point by uh, Kelly. Uh, but she also went on to explain what the different lines of attack will be. She said they will be looking to see if she's a quote-unquote proven liar. So they will try to analyze everything she's ever said mm -hmm. to try to create that track record in a sense. And uh, then she put out this conjecture I wouldn't have even thought of, but I think right wingers do think this way. She said, well, maybe uh, she carries a grudge against Kavanaugh because she actually wanted Kavanaugh and he blew her off. I find that to be inconceivable. Like, that's... I mean, to carry that for 35 years, make it up to a therapist six years earlier? I mean, that doesn't make any kind of sense. But will people start saying it? It's already on TV, etc. And so, it, 
the onslaught is coming. So this is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, prepare for the iceberg. She took a lie detector test, okay? Uh, Lazy Ford did. Um, I think that's important. And let's see. Let's see if Kavanaugh would be willing to do the same. You know, let's get to the bottom of the truth. And if she was willing to do that, then it means something. And, and she passed that polygraph test. Let me be absolutely clear about that. Okay, uh, we got to take a break, guys. Uh, when we come back, uh, we still have an amazing uh, number of stories, uh, including uh, Ken Starr. Uh, what is his views on impeaching Donald Trump? No. He, no? Just, no, no, we're going to do that story, but okay. just no. Like, that's my reaction to I know. Star. I think he might have broken the hypocrisy uh, meter. We have a thermometer for the membership <laughs> drive. If we had a thermometer for hypocrisy, I think Ken Starr would have just broken it. Anyway, we'll tell you about that. And when we come back, uh, Jake Tapper does it again, attacks Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and uh, and does so in a way that, it, in my opinion, has a very big lie in the middle of, of the segment. And so I want to explain what that lie is and why he and it should have known or must have known that it was terribly misleading. Yeah. So we'll explain that when we return. I'm Jake Uger. I'm Jake Uger. Of the Young Turks. Of the Young Turks. We're here at Occupy Oakland. Yesterday, there were peaceful marches from City Hall to the port. Young Turks would love to have to go to a campaign rally for Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders was the candidate Barack Obama pretended to be in 2007. However, the protests did turn ugly during the nighttime when a group of anarchists tended to occupy vacant buildings. You see graffiti all over the place. There was a bonfire in the middle of the street. Totally a Turks fourth day on Occupy Wall Street. So we just had a tour of uh, the whole Occupy Wall Street compound. The protests are gaining some traction. All right, I'm not we can make it happen. It's amazing what's happened. And all of a sudden, everybody feels hope. Fox and Friends cartoons, followed by, at noon, it was a bunch of Civil War documentaries for like six hours, uh, but he claps at all the wrong times. Uh, 
Our teachers are suffering, and we won't even cut 10% of the money going to military contracts. It cost the one modern heavy bomber in the A modern brick school in more than 36. A tiny sliver of the defense budget would pay for 395,000 teachers. We're talking about the future of the country. We're talking about the nation's youth and making sure that we are competitive globally. And the only way to do that is to make sure that we provide quality education for our young people. <laughs> Back on the air, Turks. We have breaking news. Uh, we also have member comments. I want to get through them as quickly as I can here, uh, making sure you guys are involved in the show. Player 2 writes in, Jenk, I drive ride share, and now sometimes under my breath when I start a trip, I say, Yalla, let's go. <laughs> I just wanted to start with a fun one. It's super fun. Of course, referring to Sasha Baron Cohen's uh, Skits on Showtime. Okay, Chris, does the CNN and cable news not know that the more they try to smear Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and other progressives, the more people become curious about them and fall in love with their policy, thus leading them to vote for them? Sounds like CNN is helping more than hurt them, and that could only be good for progressives. But Chris, remember, I'm going to be a little too self-congratulatory here, but without us... Um, they probably wouldn't hear about the counterattacks and find out about their policies. And without the internet overall, obviously, right. right? Now they can just Google it, and that's that's the overwhelming part of this. But without us, is there going to be some spirited defense of Ocasio-Cortez and some other outlet that I'm missing? Tout it. <laughs> right? And give credit to the Intercept, etc., that do good work. Uh, but obviously we've got an uh, online network here. So Michael says, the TYT seems to be the only source of clarity these days. I'm grateful for them for giving uh, me all of the information and leads, not just condensing all of it into seconds-long tidbits that are easily digestible but leave out important content. Yeah, I hate tidbits. Like, let me just keep it real. Um, every once in a while, if we're talking about a fun story, tidbits are fine. But let's keep tidbits and, and kibbles and bits. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. we need to give you guys the details so you understand the story. Yes, a yeah. lot of people are famous for 45-second videos, and you can get something from that, but yeah. not a lot. Eclectic Miscellaneous says, Kudos to Jank for being so honest and open with viewers about their financial situation and membership driving, explaining it on the main show and not hiding it from us. What other news organization would have the balls to do that? Proud to be a member of TYT, the home of progressives. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. And, uh, and tonight, for the members, I'm going to answer even more questions in a town hall. So please check that out. Uh, obviously, tyt.com slash join to become a member. And then tonight at 7 o'clock Pacific, 10 o'clock Eastern, I'll take your questions, members' questions. All right, last two ones. Um, uh, Raina Shea makes a good point. Please remember, refer to Kavanaugh's accuser as doctor or professor of lazy board. Uh, it's true, and she has earned that. And uh, finally, uh, Bagesh wrote, wrote in, officially became a member of TYT Network. I've been watching the show since 2015. Your detailed explanation put me over the top on why we need to support the network. I believe in everything Jake and Anna do. My favorite person is still... John, because of how down to earth and practical he is, keep up the good work, proud to support. Thank you. Really, really appreciate it. Everybody, obviously, tyt.com slash join to get involved. Okay, breaking news. All right. Donald Trump has just announced that he will impose more tariffs on China, further escalating the trade war that we have already engaged in. Uh, the details indicate that Trump will impose 10% tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese imports, and then those duties are set to rise to 25% by the end of the year. Also, uh, keep in mind that China has already stated that they plan on retaliating against these tariffs, and Trump has no intention of backing down. Things will continue to escalate. By the way, the White House has decided to take some items off a list of affected goods. Um, now, there are 300 goods that were previously proposed on their tariffs list, and they've taken them off probably because they realize that uh, consumers here in the United States would really be hurt if they were included on the list. It includes products like bicycle helmets, high chairs, smartwatches, and some chemicals. Uh, finally, uh, Trump said that if China takes retaliatory action against our farmers and other industries, we will immediately pursue phase three, which is tariffs on approximately $267 billion of additional imports. And he also tweeted that tariffs, this is 
all a lie, and we'll talk about it in a minute. He says, tariffs have put the U.S. in a very strong bargaining position with billions of dollars in jobs flowing into our country, and yet these increases have thus far been almost unnoticeable. Uh, if countries will not make their fair deals with us, they will be tariffed. And tariff is in quotation marks. I don't know why. And capitalized. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you will be <laughs> tariffed. Oh, that plays well on TV. You're not on TV. You're the president. Take the job seriously. Okay. So, um, this is imminent disaster. Uh, he's so proud of his beloved stock market. Uh, now, most of those gains go to the people at the very top. We've talked about this, as you all know, a lot. Uh, wages for the average American has gone down when you take inflation into, into account. So the one thing he's got to hang his hat on is how well the stock market's doing. You keep prodding this bear, and, and you'll get a bear market. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so at what point does this scare the bejesus out of people and create instability in the markets? Because... Now he's talking about phase three, $267 billion in tariffs. And he thinks that this tough guy act is going to get China to roll over. <laughs> That's not how they operate. And they're in a much better situation than we are. And they hold a lot of our debt, too. A lot. A, so they have leverage in, in many different facets. Do you think Donald Trump understands that complexity? Now, be honest. Even if you're a MAGA guy, do you think Donald Trump understands that complexity? There's no way he does. Do you think he understands the consequences of his actions? Of course not. We've discussed it a million times. Almost every White House administration official who has ever talked to the press has said, the man does not understand the consequences of his actions. Be careful. So he thinks, oh, I'll, I'll bully them around. The first time he did the tariffs, he didn't even realize that they were gonna, we were going to get tariffed back. And so, and, and even if he understood that that was a possibility, he was genuinely shocked, according to his own description of the event, that they went after our farmers. Of course they're going to go after the farmers, because they know that will hurt politically, because generally America is obsessed with farmers and their political dialect to begin with. Secondarily, Chinese know that those are mainly your voters in the middle of the country. Mm -hmm. of any sophisticated person would have known they were going to go after the farmers first, but Trump, as usual, like when he said, nobody knew healthcare was this complicated, came out and said, I can't believe they went after the farmers. That seems like a political thing. Yeah, of course it's a political thing. So are they going to strike back this time? Yes. Bet your bottom dollar on it, and we might have to. You know, I'm... Look, I, I don't wish for this to happen because a lot of people would suffer as a result of that. But you're right in, in saying that Trump keeps boasting about his economy. Stock markets are at record highs. Uh, the unemployment rate is low, even though the majority of those jobs are horrible and wages remain stagnant. But every time he mentions more tariffs, the stock markets suffer, right? The, like the... the all of a sudden, you'll see, you know, the S&P, all, all of the measures of the stock market going down. And so, all right, you want to play this game? I mean, he's so insanely ignorant and oblivious to how disastrous this policy is that he's going to keep pushing through. And as he keeps doing that, it will destroy the economy. Inflation is already out of control, which is why the Federal Reserve is thinking about raising interest rates even further to account for inflation and kind of lower it a little bit. This is going to increase inflation, especially if all these goods that we rely on China for are now being heavily taxed. Those prices will then be, of course, uh, transferred on to us, the consumers. This is going to hurt him politically. This is the one thing that even Republicans who rally in support of Trump time and time again, it's the one thing that they do not support and they're openly uh, critical of. So, Yeah, one, one last thing on it. Uh, look, there are parts of Trump's trade policy that I agree with. For example, uh, he chose not to do the TPP Trans-Pacific Partnership. I agree with that. So if you were going to say... Hey, look, let's re-look at NAFTA. Let's not do TPP. I'm concerned about sovereignty. I'm concerned about who's writing these deals. And here's my counter-proposal, and here's what I, the direction I think we should go in, and here would be the consequences that would flow from that that I think would be net positive. Then we would be having an interesting, intelligent conversation. That is not the conversation we're having with Donald J. Trump. He, his, the conversation is, me get China again. You get tariffed. Right? That guy, you think he's thought through uh, steps B, C, and D? Ain't no way he's thought that through. 
So when those consequences hit us, no one is going to be surprised except Donald Trump. So that's why I'm telling you, these are not smart policies. They are not well thought out. This is not part of the trade uh, policy that any progressive should be happy with. There's no need for a trade war done in, on these terms in this way and in this fashion without any forethought put into it. And so brace for impact. Nobody, uh, nobody knew that tariffs could be this complicated. I'm telling you, man, he's playing with fire when it comes to the markets. And this orange kid's going to get burned at some point. But then, unfortunately, we all get burned. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, moving on to other news. There have been calls from progressives to abolish ICE. And if you look into some of the allegations against members of ICE, you'll understand why. There have been uh, two individuals involved in immigration control that have faced some serious criminal charges as of late. First, uh, there's Blake Northway uh, from Oregon. It turns out that state police detectives arrested uh, Blake Northway, who's 55 years old, in Medford, Oregon last Thursday following a joint investigation between the Oregon State Police and ICE's Office of Professional Responsibility. And uh, he has been charged with 10 felony charges of sodomy and one charge of incest. Officials stated that uh, the charges have nothing to do with his role at ICE. Uh, but even though we don't know the exact details of what he allegedly did, these are some pretty serious accusations um, or charges. Ten felony charges of sodomy and one charge of incest. Uh, now, these charges came forth after uh, another individual um, who's uh, connected with Border Patrol had been arrested in connection to uh, four murders. So Juan David Ortiz is the U.S. Border Patrol supervisor who was arrested, and he's been charged with murder in the deaths of four female sex workers uh, following what authorities call a two-week killing spree that ended with a fifth woman escaped from him at the Texas gas station. Uh, she then went to go find help. When authorities were looking for him, they eventually found him. He fled and was found hiding in a truck in a hotel parking lot in Laredo, Texas. Also, uh, two of the women who were victims uh, were U.S. citizens, but the nationalities of the other two were not yet known. And people were concerned that he was probably getting information about the manhunt about him because he's in law enforcement. So uh, he might have been receiving that information. But as it turns out, luckily, the fifth woman escaped, found a state trooper who did a great job, and, and they pursued him and they got him. Uh, the part of the story that I have to confess that I liked was him hiding in a truck in the hotel parking lot. Mm -hmm. The tough guy when you're going to go commit those, you know, violent acts against women and that you think have no power, but when you think people are coming to get you, all of a sudden you're quivering and, you know, uh, hiding from the authorities and not so tough after all. What's crazy about this story is um, after authorities found him, uh, he did confess to uh, the murders, and uh, a few of the murders, um, actually two of them, took place in the hours after the fifth woman had escaped and alerted authorities. So, um, wow. I'm, I'm, it's such a tragic story. I'm glad they caught him, but I think it's important to highlight these stories because, you know, when we have conversations about immigration in the country, all immigrants who are here and, and who are not documented are defamed and slandered as criminals and rapists and members of MS-13. I think it's about time we take a good hard look at some of the criminals that we've employed to keep immigration under control. Well, look, uh, two things about that. As we've shown you over and over again, crime statistics show that uh, people who are American citizens commit crime at higher rates than uh, undocumented immigrants at significantly higher rates. Now, that doesn't mean that I make assumptions about American citizens. We're all American citizens here. I don't think that we're all, uh, in the immortal words of Donald Trump, criminals and rapists. Uh, but to say that a group that commits significantly less crime than the average American are criminals and rapists, as Trump called them, is outrageous, especially when it turns out when some of the people that are guarding the uh, border theoretically against those potential criminals mm -hmm. are the ones that are criminals themselves. And, and finally, you know, we're told whenever there's accusations against the powerful or law enforcement, no, just bow your head. Uh, how dare you say that? 
cops are always right. ICE is always right. These people just want to have open borders in the case of ICE, and they just want to let everybody run free without the rule of law. Turns out, these are the guys who don't want rule of law. These two particular guys I'm talking about. And so should we uh, trust anyone well, unquestioningly? Of course not. And so that includes, yes, sometimes law enforcement. Now, again, law enforcement is the guy who, who are the folks who also caught these guys. So have a, I hope, a little bit more sophisticated and nuanced look at the whole picture. And understand that somebody's job or even citizenship doesn't necessarily mean that they are more credible than other Americans and other people in the country. <laughs> we gotta take a break. When we come back, we will discuss Jake Tapper's interview with Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. How in the world are you gonna get the right to vote if you don't already have the right to vote? That's impossible. The reason they tell you things are impossible is because they don't want you to try. It only took seven years for them to get an amendment to get a right to vote. Does this result in millions upon millions of Americans losing their coverage? And we've been waiting to find out, and now we know, yes, it will cut millions. Public education was supposed to be the way to equalize everyone, regardless of their socioeconomic status. But if you come from a family that's poor, how are you going to afford grade school for your kids? Fight for each other. It's about the American values. I think that black people all across the country, in every We're all lying when they said the police abuse and the police kill us when they shoot. No, of course they are lying. Yes, it does happen. Yes, they do get targeted for. Why are we going to put immigrants in prison? for five years, which American taxpayers have to pay for if we're so concerned with immigrants using up our so-called resources. We're going to do both. We're going to fight Trump, and we're going to fight this stuff. It's not that hard. Yes, you can do both at the same time. Go tell her.
my church just section here. YouTube Super Chat Cliff Maya says what including the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities or the Tax Policy Center. The overall price tag is more than $40 trillion in the next decade. You recently said in an interview that increasing taxes on the very wealthy plus an increased corporate tax rate would make $2 trillion over the next 10 years. So where is the other $38 trillion going to come from? Well, one of the things that we need to realize... So let me explain uh, the beginnings of what's wrong here, and the more we get into it, the more I'll explain the different tricks. First of all, he ex uh, did what I consider to be an ambush there. Now, why? And I'll explain, okay, it is what it is, and how I would have answered it, uh, I would have been more honestly hostile, and I would have explained why the framing was wrong. She's maybe a better person than I am, and so she just answered it straight up. So it's an ambush because... No one's ever seen this $40 trillion number before. CNN, Jake Tapper in specific, appears to have put it together himself. So it's not in any report. It's not in any study. And he said these are all from left-leaning uh, outlets. No, the biggest one, the $32 trillion, is still from the Mercatus Center at the George Washington University. It's in the small footnote, halfway covered up by the giant graphics that CNN has. But you can see there, it says uh, George Mason University. That's the $32 trillion number. So they took the $32 trillion, which is by far the largest, from a Coke-based uh, study and then added some other things from other left-leaning groups and came up with a $40 trillion number out of nowhere. So since no one's ever had a chance to look at that number and dissect it, it's nearly impossible for the person on air to respond to a number that you just invented. Okay, so I would have explained, wait, where in the world are you getting that $40 trillion? Is it from an article, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera? So that's part one of the ambush. Part two is this the most important part, and it's so obvious that I'm worried that Jake was being, I say it like I know him, let me make it clear, Tapper, okay, is being, uh, I think, purposely misleading. Because when you hear the $40 trillion number, and I saw that in a headline, I was like, whoa, where did he get $40 trillion from? Well, it's because he took $32 trillion from the Koch study and put it into the $40 trillion. But as he would acknowledge himself, and even in his misleading fact check from a couple of weeks ago, but that number is made up by the savings in Medicare for All. Now, we can have a disagreement over how much the savings are, 
Um, we have shown over and over again, if you actually apply Medicare for all, exactly as it is intended, that even the Koch study says we save $2 trillion. So, uh, um, but even if you think Jake Tapper is some sort of conservative and thinks, no way, I don't believe it. I don't care what anybody says. It would cost us money. But it certainly wouldn't cost us $32 trillion. What would it cost? If we think it's going to save $2 trillion, what do you think it's going to cost $2 trillion? But the, so maybe you could add $2 trillion to that number. But you can't add $32 trillion. Yeah. That's grossly misleading. And either you don't understand any of this or you did that on purpose. Yeah, I don't blame you for thinking he did it on purpose because, as you mentioned, he was already corrected on that misleading statement when he had accused Bernie Sanders of, of uh, proposing something that we can't afford with the Medicare for All system. Let's just be clear, okay? The 32 or $38 trillion, what, the number that he stated there in, in response to Medicare for All, that is not in addition to what we're already spending on healthcare in America because we would reform the system completely. So the system that we currently have right now would not exist. So the cost associated with that system would not exist. We would replace it with a Medicare for All system, which, by the way, I think that we're underestimating how much we would save in healthcare costs. Because think about how many people would actually go see a doctor every year and take preventative measures in regard to their health rather than being fearful of going to the doctor to see if there's anything wrong. I mean, look, I, I know from, from experience, right? I have unbearable lower back pain. I don't want to go get an MRI. I'm afraid to figure out what's wrong with me, right? I don't want to deal with the cost, but I also know that by putting it off, it's probably going to be more costly in the future, as is the case with countless Americans throughout the U.S. That's why our health care system, part of the reason why it's so expensive. So. And before we go into the other numbers and other parts of the interview, I just want to be clear. Look, it's not, we're not like conservatives. We don't mind being challenged. It, it's when, if you ask us what newspaper we read in the morning, like Katie Kirk did to Sarah Palin, we're not going to say, what a gotcha question, right? So what would be a fair way to ask that same question? Jake Tapper could say, hey, listen, the Mercatus Center, backed by the Coke Industries, says that Medicare for All costs $32 trillion. I know in the past, Alexandria, you have said that it actually saves us $2 trillion. But, so let's grant that for a second. But even if we were to grant that, when you take in your other proposals, it would cost not 40, but six trillion dollars extra. Now I know that we did that. We took that from Center for Budget Policy Priorities. We took it from other groups, and we did the math on it. This might be the first time you're seeing it, but could you please answer for us, to the best of your ability, how you would pay for that extra six trillion dollars? That could have been a fair question. Instead, in a sense, he bungled it by being so over the top biased that he came up with this outlandish 40 trillion number, knowing that. The healthcare costs in America are in the ballpark of thirty-two trillion anyway. Exactly, and and one other thing I want to add to this: notice that Jake Tapper doesn't bring anyone on his show to ask, "Hey, you know what? Donald Trump just signed the National Defense uh, Authorization Act, and he added bill hundreds of billions of dollars in spending in that act. How are we going to pay for that, especially when we're dealing with a massive deficit?" Notice that Jake Tapper doesn't ask. Hey, you know, the uh, largest banks in the country saved $3.4 billion in taxes in the first quarter of this year, thanks to Trump's tax cuts. How are we going to afford that in the long run? That seems pretty expensive. Notice he doesn't ask those questions. But when it comes to taxpayer money actually helping the American people who are paying into the system, how are we going to pay for that? How are we going to do it? Anyway, it's infuriating, but there's more. Take a look. $40 trillion is quite a bit of money, uh, and the, the taxes that you talked about raising to pay for this, to pay for your agenda, only count for two. And I, I, we're going by left-leaning uh, analysts. Right. Well, when you look again at, again, how our health care works, currently we pay much of these costs go into the private sector. So what we see is, for example... You know, a year ago, I was working downtown in a restaurant. I, I went around and I asked how many of you folks have health insurance. Not a single person did because these they were paying, they would have had to pay $200 a month uh, for for a payment for insurance that, that had an $8,000 yeah. deductible. What these represent are lower costs overall for these programs. And additionally, what this is is a broader agenda. We do know, we acknowledge that there are political realities. They don't always happen with just the wave of a wand, but we can work to make these things happen. 
So, uh, again, I, I think the answer is spot on. Uh, she's asked the, uh, a question about a great number of uh, uh, different policy positions. She addresses the major one, that's Medicare for All. Again, in that clip, you said, we're just looking at left-leaning analysts. Not true. The overwhelming majority of that $40 trillion is still from the Coke-based group. So why do you keep saying things that are obviously not true? And, and he had already been corrected on his fact check and had to correct it because he was wrong. But here he is again doing the same thing. I want to show you the next clip, and then I want to give you a, a more complete answer on how we can pay for those things. Because apparently CNN and cable news and Jake Tapper are flummoxed. I mean, how in the world would you ever help the average American in a democracy? Well, that doesn't seem practical. War is very practical. Tax cuts for the rich, very, very practical. But helping you guys, not at all practical. So let's show you the last clip. When, we, when you look at the economic activity that it spurs, for example, uh, if you look at my generation, millennials, mm -hmm. the amount of, of economic activity that we do not engage in, the fact that we delay purchasing homes, that we don't participate in the economy and purchasing cars, etc., as fully as possible, is a cost. It is a, a an externality, if you will, of, of unprecedented, unprecedented amounts so of student loan debt. I'm assuming I'm not going to get an answer for the other $38 trillion. Smugness is unbearable, especially when you are wrong. It's Trumpian. <laughs> so we're not going to get an answer for the other $38 trillion. Wait, 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 Jake. What other $38 trillion are you talking about? Because let's do some math here. The Medicare is $32 trillion that you got in there. But she claims that Medicare would save $2 trillion. We've had that discussion already. So that wouldn't leave you with 38 that would take out 32 plus 2. That would be 34. That would leave you with 6 trillion. <laughs> Where's the other 38? I don't know. Maybe Jake Tapper and every single producer he has and every executive at CNN is really, really bad at math. But if you take out Medicare with the 2 trillion of savings, that doesn't leave you 38. That leaves you 6. So that is terribly misleading. And it appears now that he's done this several times on purpose. So let me answer the question, and then let me tell you why I think he has that bias and what you guys can do about it. So, um, in, in when Jill Stein first said on this show that she had a plan back in 2016 to get rid of all the student debt in the country, I thought it was impractical. And I thought, wow, I mean, Jesus, that's about one and a half trillion dollars. How, how the hell are you going to do that? But then Trump got in office and gave now what is the new estimate is $1.9 trillion in tax cuts that largely went to the rich. So apparently we could afford that, but we chose not to take away the student debt of every person in this country, which would do the things that Ocasio-Cortez was talking about there. It would lift up the economy because they would have money to spend on other things, and they're not rich. They don't just save their money. They pour it back into the economy, and that would actually lift up the economic measures as well as get rid of that albatross around our neck. Instead, we chose to give $2 trillion tax cut for the rich. But whenever the Republicans come on, Tapper is not like, <laughs> what happened to the $2 trillion? I guess he just wanted to give it to the rich. <laughs> that doesn't seem very practical. He never does that, right? And so I'm not saying that he never criticized the tax plan or that he had, you know, segments talking about the tax plan. But the overall attitude he has towards Resp Republicans is generally respectful because he knows the Republicans fight back. So... Whereas when it comes to a progressive, what does he want to do? Belittle, mock, and try to paint it like she can't do math when you're the one with math problems. And by the way, I'm not anywhere near done. I can go all day long. There's a Wall Street speculation tax, which would also raise a tremendous amount of money. And uh, there's, hey, what if we just got pulled out of the wars? What if we didn't do the defense spending at the monstrous levels that we have it now? That would create a lot of the money for all those programs. And by the way, Progressives pro propose all those programs, and it would be a wonderful day in America if we could do all of them. But you, but we can't assume that we're going to do all of them. We're going to fight for all of them, and if we get one or two, it would be fantastic. And we could eat what some of them save us money, and others are just simply. If I, I would do this in a second, I would take that tax cut for the rich and either apply it to one of these programs, See, maybe just lifting student debt. Period. Getting rid of student debt, an idea that I didn't believe in before, but given our priorities as a country, would help us much more. And the list goes on and on. Yes, Jake, there are ways to pay for that if you would just stop being so smug for a second and actually care to look at the proposals and actually listen to what she was saying.
Yeah, and also, just real quick, I loved what uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had to say about uh, people being able to stimulate the economy. Because right now, if you look at our economic situation, first of all, never take what any politician, either on the left or the right, says at face value. If you just dig a little deeper, you'll see that our economy is artificially propped up, okay? Corporate stock buybacks. There's still insane income inequality. In fact, it's only it's only grown since the last economic collapse. Right now, the economy is not being stimulated by consumers. It's not being stimulated by the middle class or the working class. It's being artificially propped up by people buying their own stocks. And so if you are burdened with student loan debt, if you have stagnant wages, if you're not able to uh, go out there and, and buy a home or buy a car uh, and, and be a consumer because of all these burdens that you're dealing with and the income inequality that's only exacerbated by insane health care costs, well, then our economy is, is set to, that bubble is going to burst. And, and right now, even economists on the right see it happen. They see it happening. They're, you know, ringing the alarm on all of these shows uh, on CNBC, on Bloomberg. No one's paying attention. What Ocasio-Cortez says there is absolutely right. And we need to do something to lessen the burden on the middle class is already dealing with this insane income inequality. And there will be stages after the next crash where the CNN anchors will say nobody could have seen it coming. Please. Even though we've been talking about it nonstop, no one could have seen it coming. Like no one could have seen Ocasio Cortez's victory that we talked about nonstop before the victory, etc. And then later they'll say, pretend, oh, well, everybody knew that was going to happen because of forces. No, you should be asking the Republicans right now, isn't it creating an artificial bubble which is unsustainable? Instead of asking sophisticated questions like that, you do this amateurish, got, amateurish gotcha questions. And so, now, what can you guys do about it? Look, we're going to uh, use the Army here again. TYT.com slash Army to sign up. We're going to send this to Jake Tapper, to CNN, and, and see if they can explain themselves, because I don't think they can. I think they do have a massive bias against progressives. And, and why? Because they think, well, look, we get accused of being liberal media all the time. And, yes, we point out Donald Trump's inaccuracies because they're forced to. They don't have a choice. His lies are so gargantuan, even the mainstream media can't ignore it. So they think, what are we going to do? Oh, I got it. We'll be balanced. We'll beat up the progressives and show how uh, fair we are. No, that's not fair. Uh, what you don't beat up on is the establishment. Establishment Republicans and establishment Democrats. So when you have Senator Feist sign on or Senator Hatch, you're like, oh, Steve Gentleman. And you don't go, right Senator Hatch, how do you think you're going to afford that? Why? Because he's powerful, and he's part of the same establishment that CNN is, so you watch yourself. And so, if some of you might have voted for Hillary Clinton on cable news, that doesn't make you a progressive. You are derisive every single time you talk about Bernie Sanders, Ocasio-Cortez, or any other progressive, and that doesn't make you balanced. It just makes you unbearable to almost everyone in the country. So congratulations. we got to take a break. When we come back, uh, uh, Ken Starr, possibly Ted Cruz. It's just lots of good stuff. Come right back. I'm Hassan Piker. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Hassan D. Piker and on Twitter at Hassan the Hunt. And this has been The Breakdown. Was that, was that good, guys? Okay. Not enough hashtag use. Hashtag abs, hashtag model, hashtag woke bay. Hashtag one black friend. I'm thinking more rings. I got them here. You need more accessories. Way more accessories. I don't know where to put them on. Throw these on. Woke bay. Not sleep bay. More sexy, too. Okay. When's the last time you post on Instagram? Too long. Come on, man. No, you need to post at least once an hour. What's the outfit of the day today? Is this, uh, is this what you're going with? No, 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 no. We need more accessories. We need... This doesn't have anything to do. It doesn't... For your gay audience, man. Yeah, Come the on. gays love you, man. Uh -oh. Okay. What, what else? What, did, what else do I need to do? You haven't appropriated a culture in a week. Do you have like a kimono or something? Yeah, that looks good. good on this dude. Is perfect. How many rings you got on? Yeah. Do we have any more? I got three. Yeah, more. can we get more yeah. rings on this? And when you're done, kiss the ring. Look at the camera. Kiss the ring. Maybe like a little wink. Islam's role in in terrorism and all the Huffington Post articles weren't doing well. I, I was thinking. How many likes did our last outfit of the day picture have? Only like ten hundred thousand. So I think that's where your focus needs to be. I, I hear you on all the blah, 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 social issues. We need to focus on followers. Kids in Yemen, we don't care if you sleep at night. Dab, mother Dab. Okay, okay. Dab. There you go. There you go. More, more. Talk about oh, yourself yeah. more. I I'm Hassan Piker. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram. Yeah, be more into it. Instagram. This is yeah. Gordon Freeman.
for me. Americans losing access to healthcare coverage. I hear ya. Attack Tommy more. I've done it so many. She, she shoots out of her living room now. Oh. It's like punching down now. We're okay with that. <sighs> that helps the brand. We made you. We got you verified. You're not like, come on. So I don't know what else I need to do here. Dude, just take off that shirt. That's exactly why Tommy Ward is stupid. I hate you. I'm Sean Piker. Follow me on Instagram. Hashtag Wolfbay. Hashtag Wolfbay. Please follow me. <laughs>
I mean, on one hand, you have Bill Clinton, who did something wrong, there's no question about it, but it was two consenting adults who engaged in, uh, you know, sexual stuff. Um, and then that has absolutely no bearing on someone's presidency, whereas with Donald Trump, this investigation is about obstruction of justice, it's about uh, Russian meddling and collusion, it has everything to do with the presidency. But for some reason, Ken Starr thinks, no, 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 don't, that would be horrible to impeach Trump. But I would have voted to impeach Bill Clinton. I mean, it's amazing. So let's go over Trump's charges and, and, and Clinton's charges real quick. Uh, potentially, by the way, it's, the jury, in a sense, has not come in yet on Donald Trump. But potential collusion with a foreign actor in the middle of an American election. Wow. Uh, violation of campaign finance laws. Uh, there is investigations of money laundering, uh, the scale of which we're not clear on yet, but it could be significant, to say the least. Uh, and and then there is the, the payoffs of the mistresses, which touches on campaign finance violations. And uh, and then there's the issue of perjury. Uh, his lawyers will not have him testify in front of Mueller because, according to Bob Woodward's book, uh, one who recently left as his lawyer said he was an effing liar, uh, lies all the time, and he is, quote, a goddamn dumbbell. Okay, so now the Clinton charges were based on Clinton denying that he had oral sex with Monica Lewinsky. So they brought him up on perjury and obstruction of justice because he they claimed he wasn't telling the truth about that. And now, to be fair, he was not telling the truth about that, okay? He didn't know so, that oral sex was sex. Yeah, okay. Yeah, go, go, come on, come on, come on, come on. We knew that. We called that. I recall that ridiculous at the time, etc. Do you impeach someone over that? I would say no. Ken Starr says yes. Ken Starr says that perjury and obstruction of justice even on something so unrelated to the office, is bad enough that he would have voted for impeachment. But Donald Trump, with those lists of potential crimes, apparently not serious enough for impeachment. Wait, there has to be a national growing consensus. But wait a minute. When you did the investigation of Bill Clinton and the Republicans impeached based on your report, there was no growing consensus at all. Bill Clinton was very popular. Impeachment was not popular. So none of the things you just said there connect to what your real actions were. Their hypocrisy knows no bounds. So yeah. with a straight face, he says very calmly, well, of course I would have voted for the impeachment of Clinton, uh, but Donald Trump, oh, impeachment is hell. We shouldn't yeah. go through that now. You know, starlight, star not so bright. We'll be Damn. Back. <laughs> we'll be back. Lolio turns the run and show us gonna be awesome we're gonna help us over here. Drop it. We became the first ever daily online web television show. No, the Constitution is the very core of America. The fact that we don't spy on American citizens, that we get a warrant, that we go to a judge, that we have a procedure, that we have due process, that is America. On top of that, they go off to this day at their own schools. You gotta realize something. These schools suck. They want people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. You ain't got no straps, you ain't got no boots. He lit these fires and trash bins all around town out of frustration. 99 plus few channel today on YouTube. It's the Shorties Award! That's the web host. Voice Award winner, News and Information Channel, The Young Turks. Oh, another way. The Young Turks! Can I curse? Yeah! Those of you watching on live stream, yes, we have adopted a pet iguana that showed up at our door. The haunted version in the dark with our silhouettes. It's opening up my head. Now let's get the best line of the debate. It was definitely the one against me. <laughs> <laughs> I never want to see another man's foot ever. They're very fun of play now. But it's on the wall inside you. But it put an anchor in you. Got a space. <laughs> I told you you were dumb. We need to talk about it when it becomes a problem. Our lack of gun control is a problem. The question is, how do we make sure that we blame the person who is dead? What kind of f***ing democracy is that? We should never forget that the most powerful people in the world exploited the greatest tragedy in American history to go to war in a country that had a lot of oil. Rolling fucker. That's what this show is.
doing what's right. <laughs> yes, go back to Mexico's going to pay for the wall. Very, very big price. <laughs> so right now I'm walking by uh, Tim Robbins. I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. I'm just going to walk by. See if he notices me. See if he recognizes me. I, it's cool, like Tim. He's, he's acting like he doesn't recognize or see me, like he doesn't notice me. It's all right. It's cool. A lot of people have recognized me. It's okay if Tim Robbins plays it cool. He's playing it cool. I'm gonna walk this way. See, I'll give him a chance to recognize. Let's see if he notices me. Ready? Maybe he didn't notice me because, you know, my head was turned. It's probably because my head was turned. You think it was because my head was turned? I think it was because my head was turned. I'm back to gaslighting. If you and I talk about gaslighting on Old School, probably that yeah. boss gaslit all his female employees. People who manipulate others like that make you feel like you're the weirdo. Why won't you punch yourself in the face? What is wrong with you? And you're like, oh my god, I feel so bad. Why didn't I just punch myself in the face and poke my eye out? I'm 47 and I just figured that was the really this year. Yeah, somebody's doing it to you or that you were doing it. That it would have been happening my whole life and I didn't realize. Right. All right, back on the other tricks. What do you got? All right. Better O'Rourke is better looking than Ted Cruz. Um, this is a fact. <laughs> and uh, Ted Cruz decided to whine about it on Fox. Their favorite adjective is Kennedy esque. They all talk about his hair and his teeth, they talk about no substance. Nothing about his record. They don't talk about his being open to abolishing ICE. They don't talk about his wanting to impeach the president. Uh, no, I think they do talk about those things. In fact, I don't think I've heard anyone talk about his teeth or his hair. The only person I've heard mention that is Ted Cruz, and it's super creepy. <laughs> okay, so look, to be fair to Ted Cruz, people do talk about how his face looks like melting wax. Uh, and so, and we uh, expressed skepticism on the show that about the National Enquirer story when it broke in the middle of the campaign, the 26 campaign, 2016 campaign, where they said that Ted Cruz had five mistresses. Like, yeah, that, there's no way that's true. Uh, and we were right. It was uh, fabricated by Donald Trump's allies. Uh, so, do we like uh, Matt O'Rourke because he's good looking? I never considered his looks once in my life. You know, and you're a straight male. I am a straight female. I also haven't considered his looks. And I'm, look, I'm a flawed individual, of course I would usually do that, but his, his policies are so good that it distracted me from his physical appearance. Like, I'm, I'm being serious. Yeah, it was, the very first thing uh, we said about uh, Beto O'Rourke was he's free from PAC money and he's free from corporations. Uh, the second thing we said that he's for Medicare for All. Those are the two reasons we like Beto O'Rourke. Those are all substance. Well, by the way, Ted Cruz recently was talking about how uh, they want to turn California, uh, Texas into California with tofu, silicon, and hair dye. Who's the substance one, Ted? Keep it real. Bye bye. <laughs>
Global Headquarters, and I want to start with a, a great guest we had on before. We had a little bit of technical issues last time, so I want to make sure that we brought him back on. Plus, I want to talk to him about his second book as well. So, joining me now is Devin Fergus. He's the author of Land of Defeat. That's a recent book that he has out, uh, but also the author of Liberalism, Black Power, and the Making of American Politics, 1965 to 1980. He is a distinguished pro professor of history, black studies, and public affairs at the University of Missouri. So, uh, Professor Fergus, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Jake, for inviting me. Um, it's great to speak with you again. Uh, all right, great to have you. So, let's talk about the land of the fee for a second. Um, sure. Uh, Republicans talk about tax cuts and how they're going to return uh, money to the average uh, uh, American. Now, we've seen that the tax cuts uh, are predominantly going to the rich. The top 1% are getting, on average, $61,000 a year in, in tax cuts. And, uh, and Paul Ryan, meanwhile, is bragging about that dollar fifty you might get in your paycheck. Uh, but let's talk about fees and how how they might be the hidden taxes that people don't talk about. No, oh, absolutely right. Um, over the last two sort of generations or so, we see um, actually that the largest way in which um, governments governments sort of grow revenue is not through tax increases. Uh, as we see the current administration is actually through uh, fines and fees and uh, and uh, Things like municipal bonds, mostly fines and fees, uh, and so this is a primary way in which government now generates revenue at, at almost all levels. Uh, we, uh, again, as you mentioned, I, uh, I'm in the state of Missouri, uh, and Missouri is notorious uh, at municipal municipal level for increasing fees and fines, um, at least historically for things like mismatch curtains. Uh, uh, so it's a star of a government approach, um, and it's shifting sort of these costs. Uh, that government used to bear uh, on to individuals um, who can least afford it, uh, particularly uh, individuals who have lower income with historically disfranchised populations. So there's a number in here that says 90% of all new government revenue comes in the form of fees, not taxes. If, even for me, I, I'm familiar with the concept, but that seems like a stunning number, especially as it falls mainly on the middle class and the poor and is a higher percentage of their income. Is that really true that it's 90%? Um, ninety percent might. That, that's again one statistic. Uh, that might be uh, uh, a bit uh, uh, over the top, uh, but um, it certainly is the primary way of means in which government is raising revenue, uh, as opposed to how it's raised it before. And so, uh, and, 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 and this is I talk about government, um, and that's why government raises revenue. Uh, but also, we the private sector sort of mirrors the rise of fees. Uh, and and, and um, there was the uh, Obama administration uh, economic report from the National Economic Council uh, just prior to the, um, the Obama administration sort of leaving, uh, leaving. Uh, and it talked about the ways in which the increasing number of private fees, and these are the private sector, uh, transfers wealth uh, in the U.S. Um, and so, and this wealth transfer doesn't like, simply happen in any sort of sphere of the you know, U.S. economy, but this rise of fees, escalated fees are most notorious, uh, not think, but most consequential uh, in, in areas in which are critical for mobility, housing, education, uh, employment, and what gets us to home, school, and work, uh, the automobile and transportation. So we see the rise of fees in both the public and private sector, actually. Yeah, and and again, that falls on, on us disproportionately, and uh, the tax cuts uh, benefit the the wealthy disproportionately. So when you combine those two factors, it's a double whammy on the average American. That's why our wages are stagnant and falling. You also talk about um, how financial de deregulation over the last four decades has made a big difference. So sure. how does that impact the average American's life? That, that's, Jim, that's, a, that's a wonderful question, and it really ties into the tax question. Um, and so um, government, particularly this administration, but uh, and I want to stress that this administration is not exceptional when it comes to uh, to Republican administration. So, so since the least Reagan administration, uh, uh, Republican administrations have used uh, tax policy, fiscal policy, as a means of deregulation. Uh, and let me give you a specific example. Uh, it's so uh, uh, the federal government says, the Trump administration says that we, uh, we're going to uh, try to um, we're going to cut the we're going to cut the budget, as you mentioned, as a um, have these tax cuts, uh, and we have these tax cuts means we need to sort of cut spending, uh, and often that spending cuts happens often in areas of regulatory enforcement, uh, and so um, 
Mm-hmm. So he uses uh, spending cuts as a, as a, as an excuse often uh, to to decrease regulatory enforcement. Frankly. And we see we, uh, this is similar has echoes of what happens in the Reagan administration during the 1980s, how it decreased civil rights enforcement regulatory um, agents, uh, regulatory officers in the Department of Education in the 1980s. We see a similar sort of thing happening today. So there's less uh, willingness to um, do um, regulatory enforcement and they use budget cuts as a means to, as an excuse to, 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 um, to not to do with regulatory enforcement. Um, so. So all this winds up having the effect of, hey, I'm deregulating the banks, which are at the top of the economic uh, order, sure. and, and, and so I won't be able to catch their crimes as much. I'm lowering taxes on them. I'm lowering taxes on the rich. But i got to get the money from somewhere. I'm going to get it from fees from the average American, etc. And then does it also affect white-collar crime? Because I, I know you're looking into that. And obviously those numbers are much larger than the crime that you would have uh, on the street. My guess is that it's not going to be have the same amount of punishment uh, as no, the, uh, abs- absolutely the great irony is um, that the the current administration talks about being tough on crime tough on crime uh, but it's being so soft on white collar crime uh, and, and really across the board uh, I, the, the, the one of the most recent examples is what uh, the CFPB the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, has recently done like about a, last month where they opted to reduce regulatory enforcement and oversight of um, of, uh, of credit lenders, of bank lenders, of, of payday lenders, um, particularly those lenders who target uh, military personnel. And so this, in 2006, uh, the Federal Guard passed a law called the Military Lending Act. Uh, and this Military Lending Act was supposed to cap interest rates at 36%. Uh, and then when the CFPB um, sort of gets initiated, it was supposed to proactively provide oversight, uh, supervisory sort of investigations of of, uh, of these of these direct lenders to or these these lenders to military personnel. Uh, but now they've sort of rolled that back. Um, and so and this is in the consequence of this um, has been pointed out by Defense Department uh, under previous administrations, um, military personnel support organizations like National Military Foe, Family Association, which, which highlights that um, a military personnel actually four times more likely to be targeted uh, by these predatory lenders than the average civilian. Uh, and that's because they know these uh, military populations uh, gets consistent paychecks and incomes. Um, know that they can't fall too much in default or debt, otherwise they might lose a national security clearance. And so it becomes really, in many ways, a national security issue. Uh, and yet, so despite the, the grave consequences and the, and, the, and the interest groups which have weighed in, including again, military interest groups which have weighed in, uh, the federal government, particularly the administration, um, has sort of um, um, been soft on these um, consumer abusers. Uh, particularly those who abuse on uh, uh, the military sector. Uh, I think that's one of the most egregious examples. Um, and if you can do that to the military, uh, what do you imagine is going to happen to uh, to those of us who are poor and um, poor consumers? Others, let's say. Yeah, I think the average American might look at somebody in the military and think someone uh, who is a hero or uh, you know, willing to sacrifice their life for this country. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people in the financial industry look at him as an easy mark. Um, you should absolutely right to yeah, perhaps they're better. Than and so I, it's, it's not exactly the kind of guys we want to encourage that, that look at our military as easy marks. Uh, and so w- one more thing about uh, the financial situation today. Uh, you say we need more government oversight over mortgage products. Are you worried that uh, that uh, the 2008 crash could happen again? Is specific to the housing market? Are, are you, you – I, I, I know that we didn't fix it enough, but are you concerned that – that we're still in dire straits in that category in particular? Oh, and I'm gonna, I, I, the short sure answer is yes. And I'm going to sort of point out sort of two things which uh, give me sort of great pause. One of them is the increasing rise of, of um, what's called non prime lending, uh, which is taking really the place of subprime lending, which is a, um, it's a, it's a rose uh, by a different name, frankly, thorns in a rose by a different name. Um, so yes, it has been a rapid increase of non-prime lending in in, in recent in recent months, uh, particularly under the, the current administration. So, and, and the second point I wanted to point out there is that uh, so we see the rapid increase of this sort of today's form of sort of subprime lending, uh, and we all know that the the vast majority of 
the, the fastest growing segment of American population is actually people of color. Uh, and they are far more likely to have their wealth tied up in housing uh, than, let's say, the stock market or any kind of um, uh, financial other, other sort of financial investment. So that population is going to uh, should fear be concerned about having their wealth extracted, um, perhaps more so than than ever before, uh, given um, the, the lack of oversight, the reduction of oversight, uh, the lack of political will of, of the administration. Again, the Trump administration has bragged about. Uh, it's been the, it's been the most aggressive deregulatory administration uh, in, in history, and to some extent that's true. But uh, we also need to see this administration as part of the continuum of a long-standing effort within the GOP uh, to to reduce oversight um, of, of, of financial predations. Professor Fergus, thank you. Before we wrap up, uh, I can't, I gotta ask you one question because we didn't get to it enough. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, is is your earlier book? About uh, black power. Uh, so, yes. just, just one question. I know we can do a whole separate interview on it, but um, you write that uh, liberalism should have been more inviting of black power. What do you mean by that? Yeah, um, what I mean is that liberalism actually, and that's Jake. That's an excellent point because um, the um, the view is that uh, liberalism was too inviting of black power, right? And that narrative is sort of won out. Uh, but what I sort of point out in my in my book and my text is that uh, liberalism creates po- has policies of engagement uh, that actually help to reform the black power movement. Uh, in the late 1960s, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, considered the black power movement the, um, the greatest threat to national security. Uh, yet and still, it was a member of the Black Party, which was central to the black power movement, who actually was the only person to ever defeat Barack Obama in the political election and got a Bobby Rush in Chicago, right? So what we find in, in the black power movement is increased incorporation of black power in the American body politic. And that increase in incorporation of black power into American body politic is in many ways because of liberalism and its policies of engagement, whether they're it's the Rockefeller Foundation or Ford Foundation, the American Civil Liberties Union, the Episcopal Church. Uh, and so we see soft power, these policies of engagement actually helping to reform black power. Yet it's still the broader narrative, the broader perception, misperception is that is that black power uh, ran amok over liberalism, that um, uh, that black power, um, could, uh, that liberalism could not contain black power, uh, which is actually not uh, historically accurate. In fact, the yeah, opposite is actually true. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, again, we'll have to do a whole other interview on, on that book. Okay. Because, you know, okay. So, so many topics. Uh, sure, but, sure. Uh, uh, Professor Fergus, thank you so much for joining us again. Really, my pleasure. My pleasure. Take care. All right. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're back to candidates. Now we're on to the general election. Uh, the person running against Trey Hollingsworth, all these Republicans are repugnant. Uh, so how is she going to beat him? It's actually a very close race in Indiana. So come right back. We'll tell you all about it. This is a shocker. His name is Andrew Gillum. He's the mayor of Tallahassee. He led in no polls. He was one of seven children born to a construction worker and a school bus driver. Gillum was the only non-millionaire or billionaire. Gillum could be the first African-American to hold that post. Tallahassee Mayor Andrew Gillum will win the Democratic nomination for governor of Florida. The American way still lives, and if the state of Florida has to show the rest of the world, then let it begin right here. You are the ones that have the power in this country. It's not with the Koch brothers, it's not with the big corporations. It comes to the voting booth. Will everybody here stand with me in 2018? Will everybody here fight with me in 2018? I'm asking for you to go out and make a difference in this state. Who are you going to vote for in 2018? I lost my mom last year. She sacrificed so much as a single mom, battling cancer five times. She never stopped fighting. She couldn't afford $2,500 for this one pill. It's wrong that families have to choose between paying for life-saving medicine and paying their bills. That's why I won't take a penny from insurance companies and why in Congress I'll support affordable health care for all. I'm Cara Eastman, and I approve this message. Power. 
For the past 20 years, I've brought power to the people of Northern Vermont as an engineer for the largest locally owned electric utility in our state. Over my decades of service to our citizen owners, I transformed the co-op to a national leader in renewable energy. I created high-paying 21st century green jobs, and I introduced innovative technologies that brought power to Vermonters in a more cost-effective and environmentally friendly way. Now I'm running for governor to bring power to all the people of Vermont. When we Vermonters team up for our common good, we can deliver more and better services without raising costs. That's exactly what we need to do to strengthen our schools, fight income inequality, achieve universal health care, and extend high-speed internet to every person and business in our state. Take the power in your own hands. Vote Christine Holmes for governor. I'm Christine Holmes, and I approve this message. Indianapolis instead of showing up. So he thinks that now that he's fought 
bought his seat in Congress, uh, that all he has to do is do favors for the people who write the largest campaign checks, and he doesn't actually have to listen to the working class and middle class voters uh, that make up southern Indiana. Well, you're in the red to blue uh, district, according to DCCC. That means that right. all he's worth is in a lot more trouble than he realizes. Uh, maybe that's why he's doing extra fundraisers. But I want to make sure I had the math right on that. So in 2016, he gave him his own campaign $3 million of his own money. And his dad chipped in another $1.5 million through a super PAC. Right. And then because of the tax cuts he voted for, he got what you said, a $4.5 million dollar a uh, bounty, basically, in, in tax cuts for himself. Uh, yeah, so he broke even, basically. You know, he paid $4.5 million, he and his dad, for his seat in Congress, and then he put his hand in the cookie jar and he pulled out a $4.5 million tax cut from the corporate pass-through provision uh, when the tax law passed in December. And what is even uh, more reprehensible about this is before the tax law passed, actually, I got wind that he was holding a so-called town hall at an uh, invitation only at a local chamber of commerce in the district, and I announced that I was going to go uh, to the town hall in order to talk with him and ask him not to pass a uh, tax law that was going to give 83% of the benefits to the top 1% and increase offshoring and uh, drastically exacerbate income inequality and make it so right now Congress is saying we have to come after our Social Security and Medicare uh, and health care to pay for the tax cut for billionaires. I went to his one and only town hall to confront him about this, and rather than deal with me, he actually shut the whole thing down. He decided to cancel instead of have to confront me and, and the voters I brought with me in the district. Uh, that seems pretty democratic. Um, okay. <laughs> So, but Liz, I wanted to focus on four and a half because uh, it's a really interesting number. Uh, is that four and a half million dollars in tax cut savings for him and his dad, or just him? And is it per year, or is it over ten years? Uh, I'm just curious about it. Yeah, so the $4.5 million tax cut is from the corporate pass-through provision, and it's what he got uh, in a single year, as estimated by the Center for American Progress. Wow. So he's actually going to get way more in tax cuts yeah, than, than what he spent in to put into his campaign. So, uh, you know, I often talk about how uh, bribing, legally bribing American politicians through campaign donations is actually the best return on investment in the country. But it, he just took out the middleman. <laughs> He's like, look, I want tax cuts. They're going to save me a lot more. $3 million is a good investment. I'm going to get $4.5 yeah. million back in the first, yeah. first year. And it, and it, it was true. It paid off for him. So That's right. This is the wholesale auction that, that we refer to as a democracy, unfortunately, in this country these days. That's absolutely right. So we're getting ripped off, and we're actually paying the guy who's fleecing us to do it, right? Uh, it's insane that we pay his salary uh, to make it so working class voters in this district are struggling to feed their families, struggling to afford health care, struggling to deal with the opioid epidemic that has ravaged uh, families in this district. We aren't getting the investments that we need. Our teachers, you know, <laughs> can't afford to send their own kids to college. And all because Trey Hollingsworth and his, you know, super rich friends in Congress, and there's a lot of them, uh, are more interested in lining their own pockets than in helping the American people. So Liz, you are the Labor Policy Director for Democrats in the House of Representatives and at the National Women's Law Center. And uh, and I, I know you helped to push through some regulations, work with Elizabeth Warren, uh, etc. We just put up some tweets earlier about how uh, Republicans at Hollingsworth are no, now looking to deregulate the banks. Uh, can you tell us about what you think is the danger to the average person in your district about deregulating of those banks? Yeah, so not only did Hollingsworth pay for a seat in Congress, but then he got installed on the Financial Services Committee. And from what we can tell, uh, his you know his sole reason for being there is so that he can engage in deregulation. And what he wants to do is take us back to the days when we didn't have Dodd Frank uh, safeguards uh, to protect us and put in place you know enroll those uh, safeguards back so that we have another financial crisis. Um, that seems to be. You know, 
his sole intention is to do favors for the banking industry. He's gotten a huge amount of money from that industry. Uh, and he's also, you know, opposed to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and those kinds of things that would help uh, the middle class uh, get on steadier ground. And he is against it because he knows uh, that, you know, he's in this only for himself, not for uh, the working families in this district. You know, another thing I think we should really talk about when we look at Trey Hollingsworth's record, he's a union buster. His dad wrote a book called The Southern Advantage, and The Southern Advantage is a book about how to succeed in business by locating in southern states where you can, his dad says, hopefully avoid dealing with the union uh, and avoid uh, strong worker protections, and you can succeed in business by engaging in the race to the bottom. And that's the family that Trey Hollingsworth comes from, so it's no surprise that Hollingsworth uh, got to Congress and not only co-sponsored Right to Work for Less, but he actually put out a giant press release. He voted to take away the safety and health protections that keep our guys, and we could use a few more gals, in the building trades safe on the job in southern Indiana. And I'll tell you what, earlier this year, we had a... Uh, uh, a laborer die uh, in southern Indiana at our university when he was on a construction site. And the rule that Hollingsworth voted to take away, the safeguard that said that OSHA would have to come in uh, and they would have to keep records and, and OSHA would know when there was that kind of violation when somebody had died to make sure that guys go home to their wives at the end of the day, that rule is no longer there and Trey Hollingsworth voted to take it away. That means that you know these families are less likely to have a parent in their lives. So Liz, let's talk about your priorities. I, I mentioned you work in the House and then you would hand off sometimes things to the Senate and work in conjunction with people like Senator Warren and, and in the case of $15 minimum wage, Senator Sanders. Um, and, and I know you're backed by PCCC, Move On, Working Families Party. Uh, so that's a, a lot of progressive groups. So if you were to make it into Congress in a year like this, it seems like you have a really good chance um, in a district uh, that's this close. What would be your top priorities? Well, look, I think your top priorities have to reflect what working families in your district and across the country need. I can tell you uh, that we absolutely need to achieve uh, health care coverage for folks in this district who are uninsured, that we need to bring down costs. So I will be someone who strongly supports Medicare for All. We have 48,000 people in our district who are still uninsured. Uh, people need living wage jobs. We have so many people who are living paycheck to paycheck and who are in despair. We're one of the 21 states that has a minimum wage stuck at $7.25 an hour. So whatever I can do to make sure that we solve the problem of people in this country uh, not being able to afford to feed their families, of people working hard and living paycheck to paycheck, that's going to be a major priority for me. And there's a lot that we could do. We could strengthen collective bargaining rights. We could repeal the provision in Taft-Hartley that allowed states to pass right to work for less. We could pass uh, the Raise the Wage Act, which, you know, it's been now 11 years uh, since we raised the minimum wage. It's honestly... Uh, um, morally just so bankrupt that this Congress can't get that done. I'd like to have every single one of those members of Congress try living on seven twenty five an hour. Yep. See how fast they change their mind. Yeah, so we showed a visual of one of your ads. It made me want to go to Indiana. Uh, looks beautiful there. But I want everybody it to... Is, of yeah, I want everybody to know the website, lizforindiana.com. Uh, and of course, you can also volunteer and donate. makes a big difference against the big finance guys like Hollingsworth, who is now taking a giant amount of money from the big bankers. So please check out those links uh, down below if you're watching this later on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, Liz Watson running in Indiana's 9th District. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, that's all we got for you guys today. We got a big post game for you, including a hilarious uh, report about uh, – the hurricane, uh, yes, there is a, something funny about the hurricane, believe it or not. Uh, and then I want to talk about Trump's bankruptcies and what I learned from it. So all that uh, in the post came for members at tyt.com slash join.